Hi, welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Click Middle East News Hour. Um, this week, we're going to go away a little bit from Israel wide in the prism because there were just uh, pretty, pretty spectacular um, elections in Australia over the weekend uh, that we saw the jettisoning of the of the long ruling Liberal Party in that country, the rise of the Labour Party, the rise of the Green Party and a new phenomenon, the independence. Um, and what does all of this mean really for Australia and specifically for its relations with Israel and for uh, the position of Jews in Australian society? So, um, and, then, and then we wanna move from there to um, looking at the Australian elections in the context of the larger Anglosphere, specifically Britain and even the United States. And so um, to talk about Australia, I have on, a friend of mine, uh, pro-Israel activist and author, uh, Ron Yontuf Hutter from Sydney. Uh, Ron Melbourne, is the author. Melbourne, Melbourne. Melbourne. What's that? Melbourne. 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 I'm sorry, Melbourne. I was I was I was in Australia in 2017, and uh, I sometimes get the the cities confused. But yes, he's from Melbourne, and uh, and I've been in touch with him since. And he's always a fount of information about what's happening in Australia and what's happening with the Australian Jewish community. So we're going to start with you, Ron. And then when we widen the conversation, I just want to introduce as well, uh, Jonathan Newman. Jonathan Newman here, say hi to everybody. So everybody knows you're here. Hi, hi there, Caroline. Hi. Hi, 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 Ron. Great to have you on the show. So Jonathan is the author of a very important book called To Heal the World, How the Jewish Left Corrupts Judaism and Endangers Israel. And it's about the whole a transformation of a minor line in the Aleinu prayer, Letaken Olam, Tikkun Olam, to uh, the be all and end all of progressive Judaism, specifically in the United States, but also more broadly. And Jonathan's originally from the UK. And, uh, and so he's here also to talk about it from the lens of what is happening in Britain, both with the Corbyn, Corbyn phenomenon in the Labour Party and on the left. And now that Corbyn's been ousted from the Labour Party, what the situation is for Jews and for Israel in sort of a post-Corbyn Labour Party. But we want to widen the, the expanse of the program uh, after we first understand what happened in Australia. So without further ado, Ron, can you just give us a sense of A, what were the issues that people were voting on in Australia? And B, um, Anthony Albanese, who's now going to become the uh, prime minister of Australia, ousting Scott Morrison. Um, he has a fairly long record, Sherry Markson, from Sky News Australia put out a whole compilation of his speeches on Israel from 2002 onward of, of pretty bad things about Israel and how that's evolved over time and uh, how we're supposed to looking at, at it now. When he was on the campaign, he specifically said that he does not support BDS and that he does support the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, which says that anti-Zionism is a form of anti-Semitism and so is demonizing Israel as a Nazi state. Um, so let's let's start with with what people voted on, who Albanese is, and then you know more broadly, we'll talk a bit about what this means for the future of Israeli-Australian relations and uh, for Jewish, uh, for the for the Jews, the Jewish community of Australia uh, specifically. So here you go. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay. There were several issues actually. Um, the the issue was a lot about personality. Personality played a very very big role. Um, they saw different parts of the, the electorate saw things differently. Uh, men tended to see more of the issues. Uh, ladies uh, tended to see more of personality issues that, that were important to them. So um, for, um, for ladies, um, issues were his, um, what they thought his lack of empathy, um, being uh, insensitive, um, being slow with COVID as well. Um, slow with COVID, COVID, you mean that people were were saying that Morrison was slow? I mean, I, I, I thought I was certain that he would get ousted if he were ousted at all because of the way that uh, his government was so harsh in imposing 
closures on uh, on Australia to the point where a lot of people in the United States were wondering whether Australia had ceased to be a free country. That that didn't have he didn't suffer from any backlash for that. It was that that was a state government of um, Victoria, of which Melbourne is the capital. So we were the ones that were under lockdown, um, but the other states weren't in that position. Um, so the whole city was locked down. It's got about five million people. And um, the whole place was uh, just locked down. We had curfews. There were helicopters overhead at night. At two o'clock in the morning, I wasn't allowed out of my, my, uh, my front gate even to, you know, somebody got arrested because he put his, um, his dustbin, his rubbish bin uh, for, to, for, to be collected outside his door. And he got into trouble for that. They wanted to arrest him for that. I mean, it became, um, it became ridiculous. It became like a, uh, <laughs> something that was have been close to perhaps uh, North Korea, not, not, not a liberal democracy. So that was the one thing, but where he had been slow, where they criticized him, was that he was slow to get um, drugs, vaccination drugs, um, to, um, you know, the vaccination to, to Australia. And he was said, said um, it's not a race. And that was used in television ads against him. It's not a race, it's not a race. And he was hammered on that. Um, He's also been hammered on, um, on, as I said, on personality issues. He's been hammered on, um, on um, having his eye, you know, when where they had floods and uh, fires in Australia, especially in Queensland and New South Wales, um, that he hasn't been forthcoming on what they call here climate change, about um, you know global warming. Is, uh, it's called climate change here, and um, he didn't react strongly enough and fast enough to, um, to deal with that. Um, so, so that's what happened. So the electorate um, depends who you talk to. Millennials and uh, female um, Australians, they, um, they, those were the most important things. Climate change and, um, and uh, his lack of sensitivity or his alleged lack of sensitivity and um, LGBTQ rights, those were the things that, that concerned millennials and these people. Uh, climate change was very, very big. Um, and he, um, the, the number two person in Australia, the most senior uh, person after Scott Morrison, the, is a gentleman that belongs to an Orthodox school. Um, he's a very bright guy, he's an intellectual. Um, he's very smart, he's astute. He actually, his name is Josh Frydenberg, and he's the member for um, a district called Kuyong. And um, it's a blue ribbon seat since, I think, since 1901. In other words, it's, it's always been a conservative liberal seat. And this is In which city? Time. In which city? In Melbourne. We talk about Melbourne, yeah. And um, it's just such a safe seat. And um, he, he got knocked out. Um, and he's stunned, everybody's stunned. Um, part of the whole election process that happened was there was, a, there was some things that have never happened before. We had a gentleman called uh, Mr. Holmes A. Court. Um, he has an organization which seems to be murky um, called uh, Climate 200. And Mr. Holmes A. Court um, belongs to the Holmes A. Court family. Um, he's, um, he's a billionaire. I think he was Australia's first billionaire. And, he's ba and he bankrolled all these independents. They were all women. They're all more or less in the same age group in their mid 40s to late 40s. They all seem to have the same kind of hairstyle. They all look the same. And um, these independents um, were there that, um, that went up against um, these, these safe seats. So can I just interject for one second? I mean, what, what I find really interesting about what you're saying is that opposed to, say, uh, U.S. politics, where you see progressive issues like, um, like climate change or the, uh, or the gender issues or, or even likability sensitivity and things like that, on the one side, you also have issues about economic growth, um, Immigration, energy policies, so that there's a balancing that, you know, that that uh, that you're not just running on pro on either progressive issues or, or more traditional or conservative issues or bread and butter issues. 
Um, but here, uh, the laundry list that you've been sort of putting out, they're all seem to be progressive issues or he's not worrying about us enough. He didn't give us um, the COVID medications or the vaccines on time. Um, so that's more nanny state issues. And then the issues of, um, of LGBTQ plus, plus, plus and, um, and climate change. Those are very progressive uh, political issues. So it seems like that was, was that really, I mean, I saw also some of the write-ups of the elections indicated that those were the main issues that you're setting out right now. And you basically are going through uh, things that were very similar to BBC and, and other reports about what, what was on the campaign agenda. I'm surprised there, there's nothing there that isn't, that couldn't be labeled essentially as a progressive woke issue. There were progressive issues in the main. Um, when I looked at um, or the way the, the, um, the television here focused on, on, on um, interviewing people, um, shop owners, small business owners and so on, um, for them, climate change was the, was the big issue. And this was mostly millennials and, um, and female voters. What um, about men? I mean, did they have different issues? Were, were male votes in Australia significantly different? Do you know in the uh, voter tolls that have been uh, posted to date, whether there was a large divergence between uh, males over 35 or 40 and uh, millennials and females of all age groups? I don't know if it's been scientifically assessed, but that was the impression I got from what I was watching. Um, for instance, um, a lot of the men just uh, said, look, I'm interested in the, um, you know, in the facts and figures of, of our economy, defense issues and those sort of things. Whereas uh, female issues and millennials spoke more about climate change and Scott Morrison's, um, what they called insensitive personality. Um, he went on television and he said, um, uh, I know that I've been a bit of a bulldozer sometimes, but you know, when you were dealing with a crisis like COVID, you have to get things done. And I had to get things done. Um, so they used that against him because he said, now that COVID is basically not the most central issue anymore, um, I'm going to have a much softer approach. Um, but that's been used against him all the time, right until the last moment in the electorate. It was hammered by the journalists as well. So it was, it was personality issues was uh, pretty high up on the agenda. Um, and of course the climate change, because there were floods and um, huge fires in Queensland and in um, New South Wales. And um, they use this as uh, proof of, um, of climate change. Although you can't prove that it's, you know, climate change. No, 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 nobody can prove anything, but, but it's assumed like that because there's a lot of populism um, that, that um, sweeps across the country. And so then the, the other thing though, so, so, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, faith or whatever in, in the, in the climate agenda, there's a lot of sense that, 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 you know, that's very credible and that people trust it. And that, and that's, that's interesting, but I, I mean, I, what I'm thinking about uh, just on a larger scale is that it's interesting, the dominance of, of progressive themes more generally and Yes. in Australia and and I think you can you're you're attesting to that and what you're talking about with the major issues of this campaign war is that correct and, and LGBTQ as well right and LGBTQ um, was that all around was that females are also concerned about this or was this a specifically absolutely. millennial issue uh no for females as well um and what, what, what I found also surprising was that it came from very very um upper middle class areas um you know, smart areas with cafes, smart shops, um, educated people, professional people. This was the language they were talking. And um, I was a bit surprised about that because uh, uh, these were usually issues that come from the, from uh, different sectors of the city, you know, different um, constituencies in the city. You know, it was um, interesting. I saw in the, in, in, uh, in one of the write-ups that I, that I read today that they were saying that, uh, in, in these very uh, wealthy areas of Sydney that had long been along the coast um, and uh, to the, you know, from like, I don't know, Bondi Beach to the opera or something like that. They said 
that these had all been traditionally liberal conservative areas. The, the Liberal Party is the conservative party in Australia for people who are just tuning in. Um, and um, they said that all of them were lost for the first time. And you mentioned um, uh, one of them since 1901, and there were several like that that have been uh, that have been liberal conservative uh, districts since the beginning of the 20th century, solid, and they were all lost to the party in a significant way this time for the first time in over a century. And what they were saying was that the that uh, Morrison and his and his partisan colleagues had really been doing something that we see a lot of in Israel, you see it in the United States, which is that um, the, the party and the, the conservative party at Likud or, or uh, the Republicans in the United States, that they're actually uh, catering more towards uh, working class um, and that the, that the elites are moving to the left. So that I think they said it was Tesla over over construction workers or something like that, that it, this was the wealthy class, the business class of Australia decided to move to the left. And like you were saying, a lot of them went to these independent candidates that are very, um, very progressive, that they were running on progressive agendas on climate and other issues as well. Well, what was interesting, there were two, there were at least from, you know, from my perspective, our perspective, there were two constituencies that were very interesting. Wentworth in Sydney um, is a very, very well-to-do area. Has a very, it's got the I think it's got the largest Jewish population um, in the country. And they had a very, very good uh, member of parliament representing them, David Chalmer, who was the mm -hmm. former Australian ambassador to, to, to Jerusalem, to Israel. Israel. And he was a very, he's a very, very good friend of Israel's David Chalmer. He's a, he's a very oh, yeah, solid supporter of Israel. Absolutely. And um, I didn't think that he would lose. And he lost to this independent. And uh, he was shell shocked. Um, and um, I know that Jewish people voted for these independents. And um, he's been shoved. You know, he, he was, I think, the only ambassador in Israel that actually went to hospitals after there was a terror attack to, to actually visit the, um, the wounded. In Israel, and um, he's a he's a genuine genuine um, friend of Israel. There's no question about that. And the Jewish community, especially the younger ones, um, they shouted him. You know, and I spoke to some people who were supporting the independent Jewish people, and they said to me just straight, you know, it's not only about Israel. You know, that was the answer I got. So um, I want to I want to actually talk about that more when we move when we open up the discussion more we talk we, talk, we bring in Jonathan to this so um, one but first before we do that before we talk about the wide and the scope of the Jews and the and the left and the progressives and the the Labour Party the Green Party the independents such as they are uh, that were elected uh, over the weekend in Australia I want to just ask about the agenda of the of the Labour Party on on Israel, the agenda of Penny Wong, who's apparently going to be the foreign minister and of uh, and of and of Anthony uh, Albanese on Israel. Um, and so just um, there's been a lot of talk. I mean, you had Bob Carr, who's a former head of Labour, who's very, very anti Israel. He really is a very he's very similar, in fact, and distinguishable on these issues, I would say, in terms of anti Semitism of his agenda to Jeremy Corbyn, but he is not the chairman of the Labour Party, um, uh, Al Albanese is. And, um, and so, you know, where do they stand on Israel? I, I mean, there's some people who are very, very concerned, uh, Sherry Markson on, uh, on, uh, on, on uh, Sky News Australia put out a whole compendium of his uh, very long history of saying horrible things about Israel going back to 2002. Um, but then other Australian Jews are saying he's fine. He opposes, uh, he opposes BDS. Like I said, at the, at the outset of my remarks, he supports the IRA definition of uh, anti-Semitism that, uh, that sees anti-Zionism as, as a form of anti-Semitism. So how are we supposed to look at his positions on Israel, where his party stands on Israel, how his party's stance on Israel is going to impact the 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 Al Albanese government's position, um, 
and and what what can we expect about that more generally? And then when we start talking about the Jews and how they voted and what they're doing, I want to bring in Jonathan as well. Okay, that, that, that's a very interesting um, thing. I think this is part of a, a sweeping progressive movement that's going um, that that's enveloping the, the Western world. And um, as far as the, the Labour Party is concerned, they have a very populist kind of approach. Um, for instance, I mean, you might have seen Amber Lisi talking about they were only throwing stones at people who were driving tanks. Right, I mean, when they, they were throwing missiles at Israel, that they um, had yeah, the Israelis it, it, in their missile range. Populous, and I would also say it's a childish approach to talk. It's a very silly, facile approach. But that's what they do. And um, they, the New South Wales, um, um, and I think the Queensland as well, certainly New South Wales, the... Um, the uh, Labour Party of New South Wales adopted a motion a few months ago um, to adopt uh, a motion stating that Palestine would be recognized as a state. And um, very senior members of the um, Labour Party in um, Australia are in favor of this. At the same time, they talk about um, you know, a two-state solution and um, it's got to be negotiated and all that, but they already discussed the outcome that it's got to, um, you know, that, that they're recognizing Palestine and all this kind of, so there's a bit of a contradiction there. Um, you also have to re remember and that. Al and Albanese said that uh, he wouldn't, he, he said that he would support recognizing Palestine, yes. even though it doesn't exist. Is that correct? Yes. Um, the front bench, which is the, uh, the, the, the cabinet of the, um, of this kind of this new government now, um, they, um, they are, they are supportive of, um, of uh, recognizing Palestine as a state. Um, they're also, um, when you say BDS, well, I'm not sure what he's, what he's actually saying because on the one hand, he says he doesn't support it. On the other hand, he refused to, or he didn't uh, condemn it. When it happened recently at the Sydney Arts Festival, they, they boycotted an Israeli choreographer and um, he didn't want to, he, he, he didn't say anything, he didn't, um, he didn't enter, you know, any kind of um, um, opinion as to this. So he might be thinking he doesn't agree with a BDS of, uh, say, a company within the uh, Green Lines, but he might be in favor of it um, in what he would call the, um, the occupied territories. So, um, well, here's what it says. I think it's important. Uh, Ajax, the uh the uh, yes. main Jewish organization in, in Australia said opposition leader Anthony Albanese vehemently condemned anti-Semitism, boycotts of Israel and the apartheid slur, but failed to provide clarity on whether labor would recognize the Palestinian state if elected to government during an online forum with Jewish communal leaders this week. Um, he said he has always been very concerned by people who argue for one state solution, calling it a recipe for disaster. Asked about a Queensland Labor Conference resolution earlier this year accusing Israel of ethnic cleansing and apartheid. Albanese said he endorsed shadow foreign minister Penny Wong's condemnation of the re resolution in which she said blaming one side will not advance the cause for peace. I think it's notable here. Uh, well, he also said here that uh, that the use of the word apartheid was wrong. Um, he said the term is not only not only is not appropriate for describing the Israeli political system and struggle and structure. It is also, I think, it also cheapens the struggle against apartheid that occurred in South Africa. Um, and he addressed a motion endorsing a boycott of Israel that is to be put to the uh, north. Uh, the the NSW conference was that uh, what is that called again? NSW North South Wales, what? New South Wales. New South Wales, right. Conference mm -hmm. in September with the backing of Bob Carr. Not a single member of my caucus supports that motion, not one, sitting he couldn't see any prospect in which it got to the floor of the conference, adding that it would be totally counterproductive. So, uh, and then he went on to say that he supports IRA. So uh, on these things, he sounds good. But again, he has a very, very long record going back to right before he became the chairman of the Labor Party. Uh, opposing Israel, supporting um, or demonizing Israel. He compared Ariel Sharon in 2002 to Saddam Hussein. Uh, he, he In uh, 2015, he came back from a visit from Gaza and he said how terrible Israel was oppressing the Palestinians. And in 2018, 
he uh, said that the government, that the Morrison government or the Abbott government, I can't remember who was in charge at that time, was wrong to be working with the United States to reject a UN Human Rights Council kangaroo court against Israel, that he thought that absolutely the UN Human Rights Council should be investigating alleged war crimes against Israel. And like you said, he claimed that the Gazans who were shooting missiles at Israel were actually just throwing stones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he has a long record of very harsh anti-Israel pronouncements. And then, um, but then on the other hand, he has these statements which are pretty strongly opposed to a lot of the really vile anti-Israel antics that are being carried out by people like Bob Carr and others in his party. How are we to look at this? Remember that there was an election so he didn't want to get into all that kind of stuff. He didn't want to get into, um, he wanted to focus on a simple message. That the Australian people are doing it tough because of the, um, of, of what the Scott Morrison government had done with the economy, what they've done with this and doing that. And, uh, you know, that they're not inclusive and, uh, you know, for all the people of the country. So those kind of issues. So he wanted to keep the message very, very local. Um, I think, my, my view is that um, that um, that Australia is going to look more like the European Union, um, and its voting records will not be as supportive as it was under this present government and, and the government we just had. So I think that it's going to change somewhat um, and probably follow the European Union to to some extent. Um, it won't be as warm and supportive as as it was with the Scott Morrison government. No. Okay, so now, uh, Jonathan, if you don't mind, uh, if you're there, sorry, uh, uh, I wanted to bring you into this discussion now, and just to uh, and just to talk uh, a little bit about um, where progressive Jews are today when they look at this kind of progressive agenda being carried out by. Um, by Labour Party in Australia, what we saw and we're still seeing in Britain and the United States and so on and so forth. I mean, what we saw with what Ron was characterizing was also this Jewish uh, sensibility that, you know, Israel isn't the be all and end all and that we have to be talking about things that are really important to people who live in our countries and um, we care about uh, these issues. We care about climate change. We care about uh, LGBT. Uh, T, Q, plus, plus, whatever. Um, and we want to talk about those things. So um, if you're ready to chime in here, I would love to uh, get your sense really from your work on, on where this stands now for local Jewish communities in British country, in British countries, in Britain and in, and in the Anglosphere more generally, because I think that it applies to Australia. Yeah. Um... Just taking, can you hear me, Caroline? I do hear you, yeah. Yeah, okay, terrific. You do have um, another, you, I'm seeing you on two, I see him, not you guys, but I see him on two cameras. One is beneath the chin and the other one is, is uh, he's looking straight at it. I, I like the one where you're looking straight at the camera, if you can possibly use that one. Try this, one. okay. Okay, Just great, that's, that's a good yeah. one, okay. Yeah, the internet is a bit uh, sketchy over here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a very that obviously, um, you know, uh, Ron's analysis is, is is incredibly interesting about the way that the way that things are going. Um, I mean, should we maybe talk about where where the Labour Party is in the UK a bit to sort of put things in in kind of context? Yeah, because I think that one of the things that's important and and really the key question that we see, by the way, we see it in the Israeli left here as well, but is we've seen for the past I don't know 10, 15 years a a progressive movement of traditionally liberal uh, parties, liberal, like John Stuart Mill kind of liberal parties to the hard left. And we've seen it now, we see it very clearly with the Democratic Party today in the United States. We saw it with the Labor Party under Jeremy Corbyn, and we saw it with the Labor Party in Australia under Bob Carr. And the question is, what is whether what we're witnessing today in the Labor Party uh, in Britain or now what happened with uh, Al Albanese in, uh, in Australia, whether this is a course correction or, or not. And um, if, it, if it isn't, what is it? And if it is, 
uh, how stable is it? Yeah, it's 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 very interesting. There's kind of a few there's sort of a few different layers to it. Um, because you take someone like Jeremy Corbyn, leaving aside the, the, the anti-Semitism stuff and, and, and the Jewish stuff in, in particular, um, he was quite old school in terms of, in terms of a lot of his um, political economic priorities. Um, he was very big on obviously a huge sort of spender and, um, and a lot of the kind of the immediate sort of woke agenda was not that kind of high on his list. He wasn't really kind of classical, um, your kind of classical metropolitan liberal in the way that we see today in the kind of the rising generation in, in, in the Democrat Party in the United States. And you see it a lot in the Labour Party um, in the UK today as well. But he wasn't entirely of, um, of, that, um, of that bent. Um, and I mean, you saw it, I suppose, in, in, in a certain way with Brexit. He was not, you know, he, he, he was not in the... Um, in the sort of Keir Starmer, the current you know leader of the Labour Party, um, uh, Ed Miliband, the previous um, leader of the Labour Party before Jeremy Corbyn, you know they were died in the wall, pro-European, um, and all of that. And Jeremy Corbyn never was. He was from an older time, um, from actually that part of the Labour Party, that part of the far left that was anti the European Union. So they um, were more economy. like the coal miner types. They were the they were the working class union member. Uh, um, uh, British laborites, the, the, the classic laborites, and then the new left became much more progressive, much more cosmopolitan, much less working class. So that's that's the distinction. That's the that's the bifurcation you're talking about, right? I I, I think that's right. Um, with the only caveat that that Jeremy Corbyn in particular was never not only was he never a coal miner, never really did a hard day's work in his life. I mean, he never you know he was never in the private sector. Um, but those were certainly his priorities. And then there's actually similarities in that respect, I think, with Bernie Sanders to a, you know, to a degree who sort of tries to speak for that kind of post-industrial world. Um, but they don't really, you know, they don't really care for him in the same way that they didn't care for um, in, in the UK that the post-industrial North didn't care for Jeremy Corbyn, um, Jeremy Corbyn either. And, and, and you know, went, went to Boris and that's all uh, Boris Johnson. And that's, you know, that's that's another discussion as well. Um, so there is there is that kind of degree of nuance, but now where Labour is, it's even more of a London sort of centric party, even more of a metropolitan party. And now one of the main um, you know one of the main fights that they have within their party is over transgender issues, um, in particular um, the sort of second wave feminism versus transgenderism. You know they have all women shortlists for different constituencies. That's you know local districts, congressional you know congressional districts um, equivalent, and um, and in some of them they insist that the on, only women can um, can can run to be their candidate in those places, and and of course there's a question. Well, what about a transgender woman, a uh, man who's transgendered, uh, a transition to become a woman? Can they be on those all women shortlists? And um, and you know there is there is a divide there, and uh, and it bursts out into into wider um, uh, in, into the wider public every so often. J.K. Rowling has um, has has weighed into this sort of thing um, on, on online, which some you know some of our viewers may have seen. So. Um, th those are the sorts of uh, um, uh, battle lines that are that are kind of now being drawn. So yeah, it, it's become even more of a kind of wokish thing than under Jeremy Corbyn. But but in a way, it's not quite as far left as he was on some of the other issues. So it's 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 kind of a bit nuanced in that respect. And and where so and it's it, it's it, it's almost breathtaking how how weird this is. You know, I, I mean that 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 these, these post-industrial democracies uh, can be just almost bewitched by these, by these, by these uh, very marginal in terms of the number of uh, people in a population that are directly impacted by them, these very marginal agendas, uh, specifically the, the LGBTQ agenda. I mean, it, 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 it's startling uh, just how uh, how small a number of 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 people in in a in a in a in Western societies um, are in any way impacted by uh, transgenderism, and yet it seems to be the this almost obsessive compulsive uh, topic of conversation in so many in so many of these of these advanced uh, uh, post-industrial societies. I find that just weird. 
Um, no, I, I, I think that's right. There's a certain there's a certain stupidity to it because it's that's why it's so much about virtue signaling. It's about finding a cause, however however niche. And as you say, it, these things actually impact so few people that it's not really clear why this needs to be such you know such a grand um, debate in the way that it is. And we saw it, I think, in, in 2016 in the states. There was an element of kind of you know Hillary Clinton was going on about you know, bathrooms and, and, and so on. And, you know, most of the country is just kind of thinking, this is just not remotely relevant to my life. But um, yeah, what we're seeing now with the, with the Australian elections from Ron, what, was, what Ron was telling us and also what, what's being captured in a lot of the media uh, discussions about the, about the elections and what were the salient issues there, that these in fact were the salient issues. So that that's kind of amazing about what it says about where the Australian people are. And, so, um, uh, so let me just ask uh, Jonathan and then turn it to you specifically about Australia, Ron. When you look at this kind of madness, um, this almost war against uh, Judeo's Christian uh, roots of Western society is on behalf of these very radical and also very, um, it's not just marginal, they're, they're like, made up issues um where, where does that put the jews how did how do first how do the the agenda setters look at the jews in this and then where does it put the jews in the in the mix where do the jews find themselves in this in this uh, debate in this discourse in this political reality that's unfolding a political reality of unreality uh in in these post post-industrial advanced societies um, I mean, whatever the equation is in, in any society on any issue, um, you can be sure that the Jews will be on the wrong side of it in terms of how they are perceived by, by those waging that, that battle. Um, and, you, you know, you see it today between the sort of the far left and the far right that, you know, for the far right, the Jews, you know, or the far left, the Jews are white and for the, for the far right, they're not white enough. So, what, what, you know, whatever, whatever is your issue, the Jews will be, the Jews will be your, your enemy. So, you know, for the, woke, for the woke brigade, the Jews are on, on the wrong side of that equation. Um, they are oppressors, they are privileged, um, and, um, um, and so on. So, um, so the Jews are on the wrong side of that. And the question is, to what extent um, Jewish communities recognize that and how they respond to it? Um, do they, you know, try to fight it from within? Do they still go to the women's march and the mm -hmm. dyke march and this march and that march and so on, knowing that they're basically going to be booted out? Um, or or do, they, do they say that this, the, the entire work agenda um, is, um, um, you know, is hostile to, to the Jewish community, so we really want no, no part of it at all? That, I think, is, is, um, is, is kind of one of the contours of, of, of the debate in the, um, in the community. Um, interestingly, what I, what I will say on the kind of um, broader side in terms of the general publics is that these issues I don't I don't think move move elections enormously I mean they move cultures for sure they move corporate cultures we're seeing that they move Hollywood they move soft power and so on whether they're able to move entire electorates I think that remains to be seen I mean as Ron was saying earlier you know these weren't I don't think the central issues in the in the Australian election they I were I mean what actually maybe you misunderstood I mean what we've been finding from the write-ups at least of the election is that what was moving people to vote was how they feel about Scott Morrison that they don't like him that he's not nice enough and that um and that he's not on the right side of of history with either climate change or the or the gender radical gender politics yeah, I mean, I, I'm, the whole. I, I suppose if you put it in the whole kind of package, then 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 yes. But if if you're, I guess it depends on on sort of how how kind of niche it goes. But I mean, transgender issues, for example, are unlikely, I think, to move a whole um, um, a whole electorate. Um, but the problem is that you what what you have in these parties is that the people who are the most active and the people who rise up and so on, the people who come in who are in safe seats and so on, they will. They will be the ones who get to positions of leadership and influence. So eventually, you know, an opposition party is going to get elected. It's only a matter of time, you know, in, in Australia, in the UK, in America, whatever it is, eventually. So the question is who who is populating 
you know, the, the, the highest office or the highest officers in those parties, who's going to be running the agenda. So you get that whole, um, you know, that whole um, uh, manifesto, that whole thing comes with it um, beyond even just the thing that you're necessarily voting for. So you might not have voted for some of these work things, but they will come in anyway, because those are the people that you are voting for. So, so Ron, that's actually an interesting question, because again, we were talking about the difference between the backbenchers and the frontbenchers in, in the Labour Party uh, today in Australia. And you know, in the United States, we just had 57 members of Congress from the Democrat Party just voting to, you know, or sending a, a letter, I think, to Secretary of State Blinken saying that they wanted to end or limit U.S. military assistance to Israel um, to, uh, to punish Israel for killing Al Jazeera reporter uh, Shireen Abu Akhla when it's not at all clear that Israeli forces killed her and it's certainly not clear why uh, Israel uh, carrying out or it's uh, completely wrong to think that uh, there's something wrong with Israel carrying out counterterrorism operations in 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 a terror hub of Janine. Um, so these this these are you could say uh, and a minority view in, in the Democrat Party, the Democrat caucus is more than twice that size, but still it's not true because people like Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, AOC and others who are on the leftward edge of the spectrum in terms of everything, including in terms of Israel and Jews and issues relating to both, um, they are dictating to a very large degree the agenda in the Democrat Party, both uh, in Congress and in the Biden White House, so, so that the decisions are being made on the extremes, especially on the left. And when you look, and when you look at that, you wonder, okay, is that the situation? Is that the situation as you see it in Australia, or, or is it different? Are the responsible adults actually in charge? of the Labour Party and is the fact that um, that uh, that uh, that the incoming prime minister, the incoming foreign minister in Australia have spoken out against these very uh, radical, hostile anti-Jewish positions uh, from, from more left-wing members or more openly left-wing members of their party uh, mean that, uh, mean less than meets the eye. I think, um, yeah, I think that um, it's part of a bigger picture. And the bigger picture, I think that um, mm -hmm. certainly within the Western world, I think that there's a, um, a move towards intersectionality. Um, I think the, um, this idea of um, linked victimhood um, has become a political issue. I think that um, intersectionality, meaning, um, you, you, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, of course. Yes, so yes. intersectionality, in case any of the people watching don't know what it is, it, it's this concept that all, uh, all progressive issues are related. So that if you're for climate change, you necessarily have to be for LGBTQ. You, and, if, and if being anti-Israel um, is, is now part, it's a very strong part, and maybe the, for, the foreign policy of the woke agenda, um, then if you're woke, then you also have to be very anti-Israel, you have to support BDS, et cetera, et cetera. So that uh, to the extent that intersectionality is, uh, is a diktat for uh, progressive parties when they're in power, then you can assume that even if specific politicians don't care that much about Israel or aren't uh, necessarily um, anti-Semitic, that they're not going to uh, they're not going to inhibit that agenda. To the contrary, they're going to allow people that, you know, for whom this is the agenda to advance it as their partners, as their comrades in the progressive, in the progressive cause. And also you've got to remember that the, um, that they're changing demographics, um, as in Europe as well, there's also, um, there's a very, very big um, Arab Muslim community in this country, in, in Australia. And, um, that's also the, um, the constituency where, where uh, Mr. Albanese comes from, as he comes from that part of Sydney. Um, they've got a, a, a growing voice um, and um, they vote, of course. Are there more so, Muslims than Jews in Australia? Oh yes, oh yes. Um, it's about five to one, at least, at least. Um, yeah, and they've also been in the news lately because um, of um, 
gun battles, throwing bombs, um, shooting up in, the, in gyms and in, in um, fitness uh, gyms and places like that, restaurants, cafes, with um, just firing up and just shooting them down, rival clans and gangs and God knows what, um, mostly from Lebanonese people. Um, so they've got a problem there with um, with a you know with very violent crime, and um, it's probably got nothing to do with the occupation. I hope not, but they're doing that anyhow. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm you know I'm being facetious about the you know because in Israel they use it as an excuse for the occupation, but I don't know what the excuse is here. Um, is so, there a significant uh, rise in anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic acts in Australia emanating yes. from the Muslim community? Um, yes, but there's also both far right and far left. Um, just recently, with an, after a lot of discussion, um, Victoria outlawed um, swastikas and um, Nazi flags. Sometimes people put them up in their gardens or uh, they, they will hoist a Nazi flag. It's now outlawed. But the, the day after that law came about, um, they, um, some people went and plastered um, swastikas on windows, including the Jewish Community Center in Melbourne, in a very Jewish area that just plastered, you know, the places were full of uh, swastikas as a response to that. And then um, about a week or two ago, um, two Jews were badly beaten on the main street just outside a, um, a supermarket that also has got a big kosher. And section. who were the perpetrators of these attacks? Uh, they arrested a 33-year-old man, um, but I understand that somebody told me he's been released. So I don't know what's gone on, um, but I haven't heard more about it since then. But uh, one chap, um, one of these Jewish people um, was hospitalized. It looked quite bad. But no, but what I don't understand is, is this, is this in fact neo-Nazi violence that is being perpetrated or is this a violence being perpetrated by other people under the banner of nazism and if so who are the other people i think i think this is um, more right-wing nazism in this case um but i but you, i i don't hear the greens or these kind of people condemning that but if you say a bad word to a muslim person um it, it, it uh, you know it, um, it evokes a lot of um a big reaction, but this doesn't seem to get any reaction from anybody. Um, that, that's the way things are at the moment. So I, I'm sorry. So again, um, when either, there's a five to one Muslim Jewish uh, ratio in Australia, and there's an uptick in anti-Semitic acts in Australia, but you think that the majority of them are being carried out by by far right anti-Semites and not by Muslim anti-Semites. Is that what you're saying? Um, that's, that's the impression I get at the moment. I know it's not like that in Europe, but at the, at the but here in Australia, um, I, the, the stuff that's really publicized is just the Nazi, the, uh, the, the, the right-wing extremist uh, Nazis. But um, I'm not aware of um, Muslims as such attacking Jews as such. That's great. They, that's that's very they, that's very encouraging. That's good to know. But I don't say it doesn't exist. I don't know. I just don't okay. know. Yeah. Okay. So Jonathan, um, if we turn it to you then when we look at this kind of um, situation of intersectionality and you have backbenchers, you have front benchers in these in these progressive parties. Um, uh, how do you think this ends up impacting policy, both in relation to uh, protecting Jews in in these societies, whether it's in universities or on the streets, from progressive anti-Semites? And um, where do you think it leads also in terms of government policies, both domestically and in terms of foreign policy on where it impacts Israel? So I'll take the... Um... I'll do the Conservatives with the party of the government in the UK first, and then I'll do the uh, Labour, which is the party of opposition. Um, so what's interesting is that actually for a lot of the con um, sort of conservative-minded people around the Western world, I think it's the case of the Republican Party as well in the States, that they kind of, they want to get in on this somehow, but on their own terms. And actually the, the, the Jews are, are quite convenient for them um, because here is a minority that, that they can sort of get behind in some, in some way. 
Um, so when people talk about kind of racism, anti-Muslim racism, um, other forms of uh, you know anti-black racism, um, and so on, kind of the, the voices that come more from from the left, the the the, the kind of the right can then talk about oh, but what about anti-Semitism and you know we're doing these things for the Jews and 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 so on, which is quite interesting. Um, and look, it's it's good and bad. I mean, on the you know on the good side, it means that. There are um, government policies, certainly in the UK, and you see it with, with I think, Republicans as well, um, that are favorable to the Jews. And there's a lot of sort of, you know, you want to call it virtue signaling or you call it whatever you want, but um, that is that is positive for the Jews. That is, um, you know, and it just in, um, in the Queen's speech just a couple of weeks ago in the UK, this is the, the speech that the monarch makes to, to open the new term of parliament every year. And, um, you know, they included a um, reference to banning uh, BDS uh, uh, motions and legislation at local councils, that's at the local municipal level, and possibly also on university campuses. It was also in the speech last year, they didn't get around to legislating it, but, but it, is a, um, it, it is a sort of sign of the trajectory. Um, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, um, very, very um, pro-Israel, very good friend of the Jewish community, banned Hamas um, in, its, in, in full. Um, you know, they, they, they stopped with this nonsense political wing, military wing distinction. Um, so she banned that in full late last year. So you do get these um, very good policies coming out of um, the Conservative Party in government. Um, and, um, you know, you see motions in Congress as well from um, that, are, that are pushed strongly by Republicans on anti-Semitism and so on, because this is this is a, a kind of, you know, you wouldn't call it woke, but it's a kind of racism sort of issue that um, the right wing parties can get behind. So they latch onto it. Um, very, very kind of excitedly, and that and that that has um, that has good good effects for the Jews. Um, but there's also the the, the 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 downside, which is that the, it can become a bit of a political football. You know, anti-Semitism really should be something that unites, um, you know, everyone on the political spectrum. Um, but that that you know that is obviously discussed is not is not unfortunately the case. Then then you come to the opposition party. Um, now, Labour under Corbyn in the 2019. Um, general election lost, um, you know, lost a large number of seats. They've just they've got just over 200 seats in, in, in out of 650 um, in um, in the House of Commons. Um, uh, the Tories have almost uh, the Conservatives have um, have I think about um, or whatever it is. I don't have, 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 have about 80 or something seats. I think um, majority. And um, what it means is that those who were left on the Labour backbenchers, a lot of them were. Sort of far left from from safer seats were Corbyn Corbynistas uh, were people that Corbyn had managed to parachute into certain constituencies. So it means that you now have this kind of larger and more influential block of far left MPs in the Labour Party than you ever did under Jeremy. You know, the, the, in, in earlier years, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn was a backbencher for for decades and one of barely a handful of people who held his views. And now you're looking at potentially ten percent. Maybe 15 or 20 percent, depending on how you count, uh, of people in of people in um, in in the Labour Party, and it's not only just the numbers now. It means that they're also going to have seniority. When Keir Starmer, you know, if Keir Starmer were to win an election, you know, he has to find people to you know populate his cabinet. So you look at a shadow cabinet now, and they're all really old Blairites, for those on the left, but mostly Brownites, people you know under you know who served under Gordon, Gordon Brown, twelve. 14 years ago. I mean, you know, these people are not going to last forever in politics. So who are the people that you're going to have to start, you know, uh, pick, picking from? And they, they're eventually going to be um, these sort of Corbynista types or, you know, more likely those who are somewhat sympathetic to them. So so it is a problem. You know, one, one can't just look at the leadership of a party and imagine that, well, you know, that's all that you're getting because um, because it isn't, you know, you're getting you're getting the whole package. You know, it's interesting, uh, Ron, I was just reading uh, while uh, I was, uh, there was a 35% increase in anti-Semitic attacks um, in Australia in recent years, it says the average number of reported anti-Semitic attacks from 2013 to 2020 was tw 280, as such the number of reported incidents is above average by 167 incidents. So there's a very large uh, increase in anti-Semitism in Australia in 2021. Um, and it says also that there was a, a very uh, steep uptick in anti-Semitic attacks 
uh, there were two major events that appear to have contributed to the increase in anti-Semitic attacks over the past 12 months, the Israel-Hamas conflict and the continuing pandemic. For example, 88 incidents were logged in May of 2021 alone during the war between Israel and Hamas and a marked increase in the number of incidents between 22 and 24 and 46, from, typically between 22 and 46 from other months. So Operation Guardian of the Walls in May evoked further acts of anti-Semitism. There were deliberate targeting of Jewish community facilities, especially synagogues, Jewish schools, Jewish businesses, as well as the deliberate attack targeting of private Jewish homes. Much of this targeting took the form of anti-Israel graffiti on synagogue schools and the front fences of homes of Jewish families. Um, in another report from the Australian Jewish News, where they reported a 38% increase in attacks, and they said half of them from, were from neo-Nazis, which assumes then that the other half were from people who are not uh, on the far right. So I think, um, I think that both of those speak to the fact that there is, in, in fact, an increase of, of anti-Semitic attacks that are not specifically from the far right, and that they are inspired by uh, anti-Israel uh, violence against uh, Jews in Australia. So I think I just I just wanted to point that out. I think that's that's an important thing uh, to mention. Yeah. There's also the um, the universities here um, here in Melbourne University. They um, they had a resolution. The students had a resolution where they um, they um, just a couple of weeks ago. It was just a couple of weeks ago in the University of Melbourne and also in Sydney, where they both Correct. passed anti yeah. anti Israel BDS resolutions, right? Yes, uh, very extreme ones, very extreme resolutions. Uh, the universities didn't act; they they just said that it doesn't represent the views of the university, but they don't act. Um, my question would be, of course, um, if it was against um, you know somebody of color, would they have acted? Um, if it was a misogynist kind of um, so how do the how do the how do these how do the Australian Jews come down on this? I mean, I found, you know, I was I was in Australia at where I met you uh, in Melbourne, and I mistakenly remembered that having been in Sydney, but uh, in Melbourne in 2017, and a lot of the people that I spoke to, both who were uh, uh, more more liberal, more more progressive, and also more traditional, said that. Australia and the Australian Jewish community in terms of going woke, that they're at, at, and also assimilation, intermarriage, um, that they're um, that they're about a generation behind American Jews, meaning that they were much more uh, conservative than American Jews. I think you see it with Britain as well, that they're much more willing to stand up for themselves as a community and communal interests, particularly we saw it very vividly and, and really I thought very admirably uh, in the in the uh, elections between uh, Corbyn and, and Boris Johnson, um, so how are how how do how do you what's the pulse of the community in in Australia today at a time when you see really the domination of the political life of political life by by a very progressive agenda? Where, where are they on this? Where where do they see themselves in the intersectionality debate and all the rest of it? I think that as you look at, especially at the millennial um, generation, I think their sense of Jewish identity is, is somewhat weakened. Uh, there was a generation that came up, that, that grew up in the 50s and 60s, um, a lot of them Holocaust, uh, children of Holocaust survivors, um, but they've got children now. And um, I would say that they have a side, they're more concerned about um, what Jonathan would be calling, uh, of course, you know, what we know as Tikkun Olam, Tikkun Olamists, because they've really, really fused civil rights with um, with uh, Tikkun Olam as part of the way they um, they express what the you know their Jewish identity. But um, in the traditional sense, I think the Jewish identity has um, been um, been watered down to a large extent with um, with younger people, certainly, absolutely. Um, also, I look at, the, from my own experience, I went to a Jewish youth movement as a kid, as a teen, kid and as a teenager, and it was very strongly Zionist, was Habonim. And um, I was a Madrid there, and I taught them all the things about Eddie Gordon and about uh, everything that we, we all needed to know and so on and so forth. And, um, but Habonim today, they, they march with the LGBTQ parade in Sydney and in Melbourne, which has nothing to do with um, 
with you know being a Zionist movement, and they also invite Palestinians as guest speakers. But if you ask them about you know about um, contemporary Israeli things, their knowledge is very very poor. I was speaking to one chap who was in his thirties. Um, he's very much against the occupation. And I said, how did the occupation happen in the first place? And he said, mm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure, but he said, it's wrong. It's really wrong. So when you look at the way that Australian Jews were looking at these elections, what do you think were the issues that were animating their decision about whether to vote for, as they traditionally have in all of these very Jewish uh, uh, districts uh, for the liberals, for the conservative party, for the Morrison uh, led party, or to vote for these independents that were motivated much more uh, by the progressive agenda? I think um, to a large extent, the progressive agenda, and that's, um, but that's borne out by the fact that um, uh, the very, very heavily Jewish area of, of um, suburb of, um, of Wentworth in, in Sydney, um, kicked out Charmer, who's such a good friend of the Jewish community. And then we had the same thing here in Melbourne. Um, the, um, you know, where, where Jews are heavily congregated, um, they, they didn't um, vote in the, uh, the, the um, Israel supporting candidates. They didn't. Um, Kuyong, where, where Josh, Josh Frydenberg is credited as having saved this country from a total disaster economically and, and also the social problems that would have gone with it during the COVID time. And he basically turned it around, and, and when he was the um, he was a he was a treasurer, right? He was a treasury yeah, secretary. He was a but he's the number two guy in the in the country, so uh, he was expected now um, to um, to be the um, the, uh, the the prime minister, uh, you know, the the, the, shadow, the prime minister, the shadow prime minister, because Scott Morrison uh, resigned, and um, the next guy in line would have been. Um, Josh Frydenberg is a very, very smart, astute, highly knowledgeable guy with a, with a law degree and an economics degree uh, from Monash, from um, Oxford, and from Harvard. And um, he's the smartest guy in the cabinet. Now, everybody knows that. And he came up with very, very good ideas. He worked very, very hard. He's also very socially conscious, where he visits um, charity organizations, women's refugee organizations. He visits them. Um, and he discusses their problems and issues with them. And this is the kind of guy he is. He's very community minded. And yet he got kicked out. Um, oh, and, and the Jews didn't support him. The Jews in his district uh, turned against him. Well, he got kicked out. What else, I don't know how else to explain it. I don't know how to explain it. Well, I have spoken to some Jewish people and um, they, um, some of them are progressive. They just told me, well, you know, it's not everything about Israel, you know, there's other things as well. Um, and I understand that, of course, we live in Australia and so on and so forth. And we've got to look at things like, you know, social cohesion and um, economic factors and health effects and, and so on and so forth. But um, this is the, the answer, but they, they're not as Israel focused as, um, as they used to be, so certainly the younger generation. They see uh, things in terms of um, tikkun olam, and um, Tikkun Olam, is, as we all know, is, is more of a civil rights kind of an issue rather than a, a Jewish issue or um, Israel centric issue as well. You so know, Jonathan, uh, I'm sorry, David. I, I'm sorry, Ron. I, I, but 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 Jonathan, I I just want to sort of get a get us an assessment because you know when we're trying to uh, think about what just happened in Australia, the rise of the left there, the rise of you know, the, the hard left in the United States and the Democratic Party and their leadership positions there. Um, what do you think, you know, when you're looking at this as somebody who really has studied very closely Tikkun Olam and, and how it is really uh, making it very difficult for Jews in these Western democracies to have a genuine, authentic understanding of what it means to be a Jew? How, how, when you're looking at, at these kinds of things unfolding, do you assess uh, where these communities are going um, and where these societies that are going woke are moving in terms of their relationship with, um, with the Jews of their countries and also with the Jews of Israel? Um, I think in terms of the Jewish communities, um, something that I always 
um, say to people is, is that they need to remember that the United States is, uh, or the American Jewish community is very different from other Jewish communities around the world. It is the, it is the only one that, that certainly that I can think of, is certainly the, the, the largest in this, in, in, in this case, that is um, predominantly non-Orthodox. Um, so, you know, you include places like the United Kingdom, um, from what I gather, um, South Africa is like this, Israel is also like this, but in a different way that may be secular Orthodox. You know, the synagogue that I don't go to is an Orthodox one. Right? Um, but they are not. They are not. Um, they are not progressive, and um, that's not to say that all uh, progressive Jews um, think necessarily in the Tikkun Olam way, and, and, and certainly not to say that, that all Orthodox Jews don't think in, in that way. But it it it, it sets a um, a kind of it creates a kind of context. It is the terrain um, in which um, in which these seeds sort of grow. Um, so that is a, a, a fundamental and very, very big difference between these between the communities. So it means that the, the Tikkun Olam, um, as it's understood in America, is quite radical um, uh, liberal political activism is is not really the case anywhere else to that extent. Um, you know, talking, for example, about the United Kingdom, you see echoes of it, um, but it's 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 nothing like on the same scale. I mean, an example I like to use is um, shortly after the Brexit referendum in 2016, um, there was, you know, this, um, you may be familiar, there's a project called Shabbat UK, which I think started out in South Africa as the Shabbat project or something like that. Um, and it's about uh, taking one Shabbat a year where you encourage people to do a bit more. If they don't do anything, they do a Friday night. If they do Friday night, they do Shabbat lunch or they go to shul, you know, and if they get closer, then maybe they start keeping Shabbat and so on. Um, and, um, and they just had it in, in, in the UK, uh, I think, last week. And um, I remember in 2016, there was one um, uh, progressive synagogue that instead of calling it Shabbat UK, called it Shabbat EU. Um, and this was its kind of sort of protest against, you know, the result of the Brexit referendum that, um, that it didn't like, or at least its leadership didn't like. And, and what you saw there was an example of how, in, in, you know, in the phrase Shabbat UK, Shabbat is the emphasis, right? The UK part is just to make it like a nice kind of national thing. When you change it to Shabbat EU, what you're doing is you're shifting the emphasis. The Shabbat part is kind of the irrelevant part. It's the EU bit that's the um, that's the interesting part. In other words, the the political posturing part is the is, is the bigger deal. So you definitely see elements of it. You see echoes of it, but it's not nearly on the same scale. I mean, Britain is also not nearly as politicized a society as as the United States is, where everything is is political, politicized. Every culture, movies, Disney, as we're seeing now, everything is. Um, everything is politicized, which is not the case in, in the UK. So it is a very different, it is a very different terrain, but you do see, you do see some of these, um, some of these echoes. On the um, other the hand, well, well, this is true, and I just want to bear it down a little bit, because on the other hand, you see that there are much higher levels of anti-Semitism, both in terms of attacks per capita and in terms of uh, the general venom of the way that, um, that, you know, the anti-Jewish, uh, sentiments are, are are reflected in opinion polls in Britain than in the United States. So, I mean, so it, it's 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 both. And you do have a much more pronounced anti-Semitism uh, in in the UK than you do in the United States, even though the level is 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 getting is increasing in the United States. For sure, yeah, I think I I, I think that's absolutely I think that's absolutely right. Um, I mean that that although I I think that. That's mainly from, from factors outside of the Jewish community, but it's interesting as you know, we discussed earlier in terms of the Labour Party and so on, um, how the community responds to that. Um, and, and in the States, um, you know, some people are starting to pull their heads out of the sand, but, um, but you know, it's, it's very slow going. And it's difficult to imagine a scenario where you could have a sort of Jeremy Corbyn parallel, you know, like an Ilan Omar or what have you, leading the Democratic Party and and the and the Jewish community uniting against that party in the way that it did in the UK. I, I, it's it's still difficult, I think, for us um, to sort of see something like that happening. I think the heads are too far in the sand, and I think they'd be too slow to um, um, to get pulled out. And and today, do you think that uh, the situation now that Corbyn has been defeated in the? I mean, you, what you were saying. I think is is the key point that you mentioned earlier was that the backbenchers that are now really the only ones who survived the carnage of the last elections, that they are very radical, and that they will be the elder statements of statesmen of the 
Labor Party as they start uh, rebuilding after the Corbyn loss, and so that that does bode ill for the future of the Labour Party in Britain. And and yeah, and the grassroots membership. I mean, there's been an enormous purge, but it's by no means it's by no means complete, and there's still a lot of these sorts of people. I mean, the Labour Party grew into the largest political party in in Europe um, um, in, in the Jeremy Corbyn era. So. Um, there are still plenty of those people left. And, and look, the, the leadership, you know, while it's made enormous strides, is, is at the end of the day, it's a pragmatic leadership. It's not a principled, not a principled one. And I mean, Keir Starmer sat in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet for years, said basically nothing about anti-Semitism, backed him 100% in the, um, in the 2019 general election, and only now has sort of said, I'm going to tear out anti-Semitism by its roots and so on. He's not a, he's not a bad person, and there's certainly, he's certainly made you know, unquestionably made a lot of progress, but, you know, unquestionably the, uh, the problem um, still remains. And, um, and, you know, he is not a kind of principal figure to go to go after this. Um, you know, I'll just give you one quick example. There was there was local council elections, municipal elections across the country um, uh, a few weeks earlier this month. And um, there was uh, w- w- one councillor was particularly uh, got, got particularly prominent news. Um, this is a Labour councillor in East London who had posted an article that that basically um, justified the genocide of the Jews, the Nazi genocide of the Jews. I mean, this was this was incredibly egregious, even by you know even by Labour standards. Um, and um, apparently, a complaint was made by an activist organisation to the party a week before the election, and nothing happened. Then, only on the eve of the election, literally the day before, the Jewish Chronicle, one of the main uh, uh, Jewish newspapers. Um, did sort of a big spread on this, and then you know by you know within like a couple of hours she had been suspended. Um, I mean she went on to win re-election the next day, but but you know, um, but the point is that the party seemed to spring into action when you know when, when there was bad publicity. They didn't seem so quick, at least according to the report, to spring into action when the complaint was originally made. So you know there are still these lingering concerns that this is about pragmatism and about PR and looking like you're doing something. Um, more perhaps than it is about uh, a matter of principle, but you know we wait to see. All right, and Ron, uh, just final words about Australia. Uh, when when you look at the result, I mean, I, there were so many reasons to be angry with Scott Morrison, I guess, uh, for Australians just from a domestic perspective. I mean, uh, but. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, he's being replaced by a party or really two parties and the Green Party is very anti-Israel um, and uh, by Labour who is led by, which is led by a person which very long record, even though he said, you know, pretty good things in the past. And I also saw that there was a lot of uh, criticism of him going forward and uh, going towards the elections by people in the party saying that he's uh, he's abandoning the, the left for votes and, uh, you know, he's, he's no good because he's not standing by his principles. And so the question is, you know, he's had a long record from 2002 to 2018 of saying some pretty vile anti-Israel things, of having anti-Israel positions on, on a whole slew of very critical issues. Um, and yet, you know, the, the Australian Jewish community, or much of it, decided that they cared more about the, the progressive agenda um, than about uh, these 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 concerns um, and how do you see this unfolding uh, in the, I mean obviously we're very early on we just had the elections you know what what is your level of concern here for where Australia is going in terms of its uh, positions uh, is there reason to be optimistic look I'm 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 a bit um, I'm concerned and there are, there are a few there are a few reasons why I'm concerned he's not the only one that's got this anti-Israel animus. There's some people on the front, front of his front branch that uh, share the same views. We also have a very, very strong, strong um, pro-Palestinian bent, um, which is a pop, it's really a populist kind of um, opinion about, you know, children throwing stones against tanks and, and jets and all this kind of thing. It's, it's childish, but that's, that's the reality. Um, so... If you look at the, the Greens, for instance, the Greens, they, basically, they, they were the big winners in this whole thing. They, they've really um, increased their, their seats in, in the parliament. They, they've, they've really strengthened themselves quite considerably. And um, this party uh, declined to meet with Jewish organizations, 
declines to sign the IHRA um, definition of anti-Semitism. Um, and um, they're going to have a very strong voice in Parliament, which Labour will need, I think, at some stage, because they need 76 in order to, um, to, um, to, to have a majority. And at the moment, they've got 72. Um, so they've got to use the, um, you know, the, the votes of the, um, the independents and the Greens to push through their, their legislation, their agenda, and so on and so forth. Um, so at the moment, I don't feel very, very um, confident about um, Australia and um, the Jewish community. I think there's going to be tension. I think that even with uh, the established Jewish organizations, they tend to be, I would say, center, center left a little bit. Um, they, they, they openly acknowledge that um, there are some, you know, some major differences, but hope that um, we can walk you know, towards the good of Australia and, um, and be you know, inclusive and so on and so forth. But I think that along the, I think from now on, I think that um, Australia is not going to be voting as enthusiastically with, um, with Israel, America and Canada. Certainly, um, I don't think, I think they'll be closer to the European Union positions. Well, well, you know, I think I think you both. I just want to, you know, give my take on this for a second. So, um, I, I think you know what we're looking at here really is indicative of a larger problem. Author Douglas Murray talks about it in *The War Against the West*, his new book, um, that there are just a lot of very, very powerful forces inside of Western societies um, that really hate the West and want to undermine it, um, and opposing Israel as a sort of um, uh, I, 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 it, it is the uh, distillation of of, the, of nationhood and the nation state um, that if you if you want to advance a post nationalist agenda, post Western agenda, an anti Western agenda, Marxist agenda, then you're going to go against the the most unique people, the most authentic people uh, in in history, and that that of course targets Israel and and of course Jews who support Israel uh, in these in these societies. Um, and you know, I, I think it's um, it's good that uh, that uh, uh, that the new or the the new uh, leadership of Australia has come out against uh, against BDS and uh, and all the rest of it. But I think that you have to look at the whole span of their long opposition to Israel um, and their long hostility towards Israel, and be very concerned. Uh, we're we're seeing where this is leading the United States under Biden. Um, and, and it's a shame because uh, Australia is also moving towards China um, and away from the United States, it's gonna have a real impact on China and, chi and the Chinese American uh, competition, et cetera, but that's a completely different issue. I think for Israel's perspective, you know, it, it really, again, I, I say this in every, in every episode almost, uh, uh, that the main thing that we have to be looking towards is strategic independence and that Israel has to be able to truly back its words when it says that it's capable of defending itself by itself and to limit its dependence on, on the United States and to be able to work with everybody, but from a position of strength and not from a position of of, of begging for assistance because the world is changing before our eyes. The very fact that um, very esoteric issues uh, can captivate uh, the attention of the media, capture the agenda of, of uh, politics, uh, the political agendas that, um, in, in Western democracy after Western democracy uh, is very troubling. And, um, and we have to be looking at this um, very clear-mindedly and recognize that things are changing and not for the better. So having said all of that, um, I just want to thank you both. I want to thank Ron and I want to thank Jonathan uh, for joining me today. I think it was a very illuminating discussion. I think that uh, I think it's important to understand and keep our eyes out on countries like Australia and of course Britain and see that what we're experiencing um, is part of a is part of a very very large trend throughout the Western world. 
uh, towards uh, something different from what we grew up with. That is in terms of Western civilization that's based on, uh, based on uh, Judeo-Christian principles and values uh, emanating from the enlightenment and from a whole thousands of years tradition of reason and moving towards something else that's based on feelings and momentary passion. So I think this is this is something we have to take take a close look at, be aware of, follow carefully, and uh, and cover our, and and as I say, mind your back. So thank you very both. Bo thank you, bo thank you both very much. Let me get out this last sentence, and I look forward to talking to you again uh, and revisiting some of these issues on uh, later episodes of the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. It was lovely seeing you again. Thank you. Oh, it's always a pleasure to see you, and I'll be happy to come back and visit you in Australia sometime. Take care. Oh, you're very, very welcome.